Let's stand and let's sing together. Let's praise our God and King. Let's lift up this song of praise to the Creator.
Yes, praise the Father, praise the Son. You can be seated. Emmanuel, good morning. Great joy to be with you this morning as we've gathered to worship our Lord and lift up our Savior Jesus. This morning, if you're here and you'd like to connect in some way, in front of you, you should find a connect card. You can fill out any need you have or any way you'd like to connect. Or a prayer card if you'd like to let us know a specific way we can be praying for you in your walk with Christ. This morning is Mother's Day, and I want to do something a little bit fun just to have uh, some pleasure with one another. You'll notice here on the front on the altar are a number of books that we'd like to give away today. So I'm going to ask a couple questions, and uh, if these questions apply to you and you're, you're a lady here, you can answer affirmatively. You'll win one of the prizes. You can come down at the end. It may be the fastest you ever come down to the altar. <laughs> and you can receive whatever book you, you'd like to receive. Maybe you, you, you look at them and you realize, ah, none of those are really for me. Share it with somebody else or leave it for the library and all of us can get use from it. Okay? All right, first question. If you're a lady here and you've ever served in nursery or taught a class, would you raise your hand? Okay? All right, you can put your hands down. If you've ever done one of those things for more than a year, would you put your hand up? Okay, put them down. If you've done it for more than five years, put your hand up. Okay, more than 10 years, if you're not ashamed, more than 20 years, if we want to go that far. Any, it looks like we have a couple for 20, 25, 30, you started when you were two years old, I know, yeah. Uh, 30, anybody more than 30? 30, 30, 35, 35, we'll just stop it there, well done, well done, yeah, very good, very good. All right, if you are a lady that has brought a meal recently to someone who is not related to you, that's what this one is. So has anyone done that in the last month, brought a meal to someone who's not related to you? Good. All right, last two weeks. Last week? Two? Last three days? Come on. (laughs) Uh... Did you share them with each other? That's kind of what it feels like. Uh, yesterday. Did you do it yesterday? Yesterday for you? Friday. Friday for you? We'll call that one a tie. We'll call that one a tie. Good job. Very good. Very good. All right. You have to tell me the title. You have to know the title of the most recent Christian book you've read. Okay. So did anyone finish reading a good Christian book in the last two weeks? In the last two weeks. Okay, has anyone heard of a book written by... <laughs> um, anyone in the last month finish a book? Okay, do you know the title? Okay, we'll go with that. Very good, Laura. Very good. Thank you. All right, last lady to hand write a letter to someone. Can't be email, can't be text, can't be a tweet. Okay, all right, we have one in the last month for you, last month for you. Let's go last week, Thursday for you, Thursday or Friday. Anyone else can beat that? All right, Heather, good job, good job, okay. All right, I think I have one more. A person who's, let's say, your mother or your daughter lives furthest away. Your mother or daughter lives furthest away. Anybody, and I know it depends how fast you drive, um, but anybody have a mom that lives more than five hours away, mom or daughter that lives five hours away? Okay. Keep your hand up if it's more than 10. I know we have a couple of California. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, I'm doing the math right now. Uh, More than 15? More than 15? More than 20 by car? We have a lot of hands still up. More than 25? More than 30? If my wife was driving, we could do it in 22, I think. (laughs) More than 35? Seriously. More than 40? 50? You've never driven it, so you're just going whatever number I'm going to go with. (laughs) You're just going to keep the hand up. (laughs) Uh, So, Sarah, how far is it for you? Coast to coast? How long does it it take you guys? Seven days by car. Anyone think they really can beat seven days by car? 
it is to California. So Los Angeles, San Francisco. I don't have Google Maps. Is San Francisco further, probably? I think San yeah. Francisco. <laughs> All right. We'll say Louise wins, but we do have a couple extra. We'll see who beats each other down the aisle, okay? Good job. Good job, ladies. All right. I'm thankful for you all. Let me, uh, let me lead us in prayer this morning. Dear God, we thank you, Lord, that you are great and that you are always greatly to be praised. We thank you, Lord, that in your greatness, your wisdom, and your goodness, you created the world. And thank you, Lord, for creating male and female in your image. Thank you, Lord, that we know the name Eve as mother of all living. Thank you, Lord, for your wisdom and goodness that you would send your own son out of love for this world. And Lord, your own son was supernaturally born to Mary. There he was carried by her and then ultimately delivered and then nurtured, and he grew perfectly in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. And Lord, thank you that Jesus ultimately grew to purposefully go to the cross, even for his own mother's sin. And Lord, thank you that she rejoiced in her Savior when he was promised. And thank you that he honored his mother on the cross when he called out for John to look after her, thereby showing us what it means to honor your father and mother. Lord, we are thankful, though, that we know that you have compassion on those who hurt, especially in a day like today. Thank you, Lord, for your love for widows and orphans. We thank you that we get to partner with foster care and with Baptist Children's Home and Send Relief all over the world. Thank you, Lord, for those good endeavors. We thank you, Lord, that you know the innermost longings and hurt of every heart, and you have compassion on them all. Thank you that you love the overlooked, like Leah, the rejected, like Hagar, the used, like Bathsheba, the renowned for immorality, like Rahab, the hopeless, like Sarah, the outspoken, like Martha, the hurting, like her sister Mary, the overwhelmed and facing death, like Esther, and those who've endured unspeakable loss, as Mary did when she saw Jesus crucified. Lord, thank you that you know each person, each need, and Lord, thank you that you are good and that you provide the hope and the help we need in your son, Jesus, for them all. I thank you for my wife, who's home with a sick child this very day. Lord, I thank you for my mother and my mother-in-law. I'm so grateful that I can say, along with Charles Spurgeon, that my mother was the starting point of all of the goodness and grace that I now enjoy. And Lord, I thank you for... Um, my sisters in Christ, wherever they are, whatever their situation is this morning, and I pray that everything that happens would both glorify your name and work all things for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. In Christ I pray, amen. Good morning. I have a, just a couple announcements for us. The first is VBS is coming up, so mark your calendars for July 16th through 17th and start thinking through what you would like to do as far as serving for that. There is a list in the back if you're not sure what our needs are, as well as a place to sign up, or you can sign up in the weekly email that comes out. Registration for children will open soon, but you can start telling your neighbors and your friends to mark the calendars for July 16th through 17th. Next, this Sunday meal is going to be coming back, and so mark your calendars for May 29th so that right after the service, we'll uh, have a fellowship and enjoy a meal together and start thinking through what side you would like to bring. So we can have some yummy sides to you as well. Uh, also, in the back of your pew, if you have a prayer request, those prayer requests can be written down on the red cards, and Pastor Josh and Pastor Hunter would love to pray for you this week, as well as if you would like to give to Emmanuel. There's envelopes in the back, and all of those can be placed in the offering basket in the back. And then one last announcement, which he's probably not going to like this, but I'm going to say it anyways. Um, in 2020, Hunter graduated with his MDiv and then went back to school to get his THM degree, so master's in theology, so another degree up, and he is done. Well, he has a final tomorrow. So, <laughs> so next Sunday, mark your calendars, next Sunday the 15th at 6 p.m. at the Shepherd's Church, which was formerly Colonial Baptist Church. He is graduating and walking in that fancy robe and hat. So if you would like to come join me and make a little noise and kind of be a ruckus while he walks across the stage, please come and do so. So at 6 p.m., if you need the address or any details, come join us. There's a dessert reception to follow afterwards. Okay, well. See if I ever let my wife do announcements again. No, I'm just kidding. All right, let's... Uh, 
let's go ahead and stand. Let's transition. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and read scripture together. Romans 12, 9 to 13. Let's read this together. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. And I think we're ready for the next slide. So, yes. Verse 11. Romans, I think we're having... Okay, there it is. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this church and for the community, the fellowship that we have here. God, thank you that you have just given us clear instructions for how we're to love and serve each other. God, thank you that we can share in each other's needs. Uh, Lord, thank you that we are blessed to be able to show hospitality to others. Lord, we want to take seriously everything that you say. Lord, when you want us to let our love be without any hypocrisy, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to do that. Lord, may we be just, may Emmanuel especially be characterized as a church that loves each other and loves people outside the church too. Lord, even with that, may we abhor what is evil. God, teach us how to do this because it's not easy. Help us to cling to what is good in society where the shifting sands of morality are always uh, just moving around us, Lord. It's hard sometimes to get our bearings. Lord, your word is a steadfast anchor, so help us to understand and believe what is true, and Lord, to proclaim it, but to do it graciously. God, I pray that you'd help us as we worship you and lift up your name today. Lord, help us to be able to um, think deeply and meditate deeply on your truth as we study the word today. And God, would you uh, just bless this music that we lift to you in an offering of praise. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.
morning. Uh, I'm going to hijack just for a second from Wally. Um, I'm David Lee, and um, Bob Williams and Colin Devlin and I are the personnel committee this year. And I want to let you know that um, our church uh, administrator, Caleb Waller, is getting married uh, this coming weekend. He's flying out, I think, Wednesday uh, to uh, Mississippi to go get married, and he'll be gone for a couple of weeks. And uh, we just want to let you all have the opportunity uh, to love on him a little bit and uh, make a love offering to him and his new bride. Uh, so at the end of the service, if you want to do that, uh, Bob and Colin and I will be holding silver plates, not gold plates, which is the regular offering. But if you want to um, just offer something um, as a love offering for Caleb as he gets married, uh, you can drop it in one of the plates that one of us will be holding by the, the side and the back door. So, And if you didn't don't have your checkbook, you don't have any cash, and you want to uh, still give something anyway, just see me, and we'll work something out, and then you, know, you can reimburse me later or something like that. Good morning. Our scripture today is from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26, 27, and 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The Word of God. Amen. Now will you pray with me? God our Father, God our Savior, God our Helper, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. God is great. God is good. There is none like God. Our God is the Lord. Lord, we have heard a prayer this morning that you show us truth and that you convict us that what you show us is truth. Lord, you give us the helper to know your truth, to know you. And Lord, in these verses we have just read, we see your prescription for man and for woman. And Lord, your prescription is true and it is right. There is no wrong in God. We pray, Lord, for the message that we are about to hear from your appointed under-shepherd, Josh. Lord, may he deliver your message just as you have prepared him to do. Do not let him interject anything, Lord, that does not come from you. As we hear from you, Lord, convict us of your truth. Humble us before your truth. Lord, before we leave this place and as we leave it, may we esteem Jesus more. May we think higher thoughts of Jesus and more often. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, 
be all honor and glory forever, not just this day, but forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as you can see on the screen, we're going to 1 Samuel, even though our brother just read Genesis. So in the Pew Bible, if you open a 267, that'll put you there as we go to 1 Samuel this morning. Today is Mother's Day. I don't always preach um, a Mother's Day sermon on Mother's Day in the same way I don't always preach on government on July 4th week. In 1914, President Woodrow Wilson instituted the federal holiday of Mother's Day, which is, is a great thing. We, of course, know biblically we don't have a responsibility to pause for American holidays. Colossians 2, 16 and 17 says no one should pass judgment on new moons or festivals on, or Sabbaths even, because these are a shadow of what was to come and the substance is Christ. Romans 14, verse 5 says one person esteems one day is better than another. Each should be convinced in their own mind. And so we, we know that uh, this is a good thing, but not a required thing biblically in terms of this particular holiday. But the principle underneath it is required, isn't it? The fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother. And that commandment does look different in different stages of life, and it's very important that we pause to think about it. But something that I thought was interesting as I thought about that this week is how rare a celebration for Mother's Day has become among even evangelical churches. Churches don't stop for Mother's Day in the way they previously did. There's some legitimate reasons for that. Let me acknowledge those first. One of the reasons churches no longer celebrate Mother's Day in the way they did in previous generations that I'm sympathetic to is that I think churches rightly want to be careful to not communicate that being single or singlehood is somehow less than marriage or parenting, and that's a right caution. The Bible fully values singlehood. Paul even presents it as preferable, and one can be a fully mature Christian and be single. So I think that's important to be careful about. Another reason I think people are hesitant to celebrate Mother's Day at church is, is because we know that Mother's Day, and really every day is like this, a day can be very wonderful for one group of people and very hard and difficult for a different group of people. Um, I'm speaking personally when I tell you in our own home and in our own family, we know what it's like to experience unmet desires, to have miscarriages, to go through infertility, uh, to have family members who've tried to adopt and put significant amount of time and energy into that only for it to not go through. Surely some people today think of painful memories or lost loved ones, and we don't want to overlook that, so we surely want to remember that as well. My compassion ought to be there, surely, as a brother in the Lord, thinking for those who have a day that is difficult. I want to remind us, though, that we need to learn to find God all satisfying, even when life is unsatisfying. We need to be able to bless the name of the Lord, whether he gives or takes away. Another reason people don't celebrate this day in the way they used to is I think some people are, are concerned that the day has become consumeristic and, and shallow. There's some legitimate concern there as well. But, but we should always remember that if we approach any day, surely any holiday or celebration, um, with self-entitlement, then there will be disappointment. <laughs> that will be a law of diminishing return, surely. We could never be compensated enough to meet the desires that we have. So there are many reasons people don't celebrate Mother's Day anymore, but I really thought it would be important today to open the Bible and talk about what God says about mothers, and I'll just candidly tell you one of the reasons why, and one of the reasons is because I'm raising a young girl. And so as I'm raising a little girl and thinking about, now where would she hear what it means to be a godly woman and where would she hear how she should think about her own mother when she does what everybody does when they grow up and they reflect back on what their parents did well and what they didn't do as well? What will give her the tools to make that criteria wisely? And in God's providence, um, I came home and I turned on the local news and I found she's not going to find the answer from there. <laughs> And I was watching the news, and they were talking about how to approach Roe v. Wade this Sunday on, on Mother's Day. 
There was a mom on our local news that was talking about how on, uh, she's a psychologist, and she was saying that Mother's Day is all about self-care. And she said the most important thing is not only should your family honor you on this day, but you need to honor yourself. And as I heard those messages, I met with my own wife. We were meeting at the park after one, uh, one work day, I think it was Monday or Tuesday. And I said to Steph, Steph, please help me here. I, I've written three outlines. My first outline is just to keep Genesis. My second outline is, is fairly safe, honestly. And my third outline is to address straight on all the pressures of our culture with biblical truth. Which one should I do? And Steph said to me, well, this is like the one day a year people are already thinking about these things, so you should hit it straight on. <laughs> so I said, yes, ma'am, and I went back to work, and I typed out 76 straight pages. And before you faint, I'm not going to preach all them this morning, uh, but here's, here's what I think we should do this week. This morning, I'm just going to throw a couple pebbles in the pond that I pray will reverberate that I think, Lord willing, will give us a foundation. But can I encourage you to do something that has been helpful in the past? Please come Wednesday with particular questions and concerns, and we'll have a discussion group. And I would love, especially for our ladies, to come to that and to, and to raise things you're concerned about, things you think are overlooked. Ask good, hard questions. But this morning, hopefully, we'll at least get some foundation. What we saw in the news is just the reality that my daughter will be pressed with, that we're all being pressed with, and that is the one God that we worship in our Western culture is the self. We worship the self. Uh, one author put it well recently. He said, we see ourselves as pieces of living Plato attached to a will. He went on to write, millions of our neighbors believe, not by conclusion after careful thought, but just intuitively that human beings can sculpt themselves into whatever they desire, if necessary, through hormones, surgery, or legislation. We believe the self is ultimate. Perhaps you've noticed in the news recently that Disney has taken a publicly, overtly hostile stance against God's revealed word and his revealed wisdom. But of course, we should realize that um, it's not like that's new even for Disney to do. And I'm not saying it's wrong to watch any of their movies, but I think Trevin Wax helps us when he wrote this. You may think we've come a long way from The Little Mermaid, but the distance between the 1980s and today is closer than you realize. The expressive individualistic outlook on life, that the purpose of life is to look within and discover yourself, is everywhere evident in Disney's films from the 80s and 90s, and it's grown in influence. The great anthems like Part of Your World, Reflection, and Let It Go simply continue that tradition. So the idea that we should look within has been a sinful temptation since the fall, but since Rousseau and others, it's been exasperated. Can I just say this morning to us, our solution is not found within. We must first learn to look up before we can even properly assess within. And once you've looked up and then you've looked in, you know you need to look outside of yourself for any hope for the rest of your eternity. So my daughter would be taught in our culture that the self is ultimate. She would be taught that everything and everyone else exists to boost and serve the self. And so in the culture that she is growing up in in our current American day, children, or the idea of being a mother, would cause you to look at children in one of two ways. Children now are to be enthroned so that they can boost the self, or they're to be endured or escaped so that I can better serve the self. So let me now at the beginning of the sermon talk about some ways in our culture we are eroding God's design. First, we are literally causing motherhood to disappear. Now, I, I just admitted, and we could talk about this more, in our own life we know what it's like to not have children when you would like to. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about those with capacity and opportunity who just have now diminished the value of motherhood. Did you know that in the year 2020, our birth replacement rate is now 55.8 per 1,000 women, according to NPR. 538 records that it's now 1.64. Just to help you know what that means, in order for our country to continue to exist, we need a replacement rate of 2.1. We're now at 1.64 which is the lowest in history. Some people think, well, maybe it's the pandemic, but the previous low was 2019, and the previous low was 2018. We're actually hitting lower numbers than we ever have at a faster accelerating rate than we ever have. 
Now, part of that's because in the economic matrix that we are born into today, having a child is actually financially disadvantageous. Think about it. For thousands of years, if you lived in an agrarian culture, more children meant more money. But now that you live in an information culture, more children means more financial burden. So the economy is actually set up to disincentivize people from even having children. Of course, our culture this week is thinking about Roe versus Wade, and there's much for us to pray over here. But did you know that if you were to think through church history, the debate was not whether or not life should be terminated, but whether or not it was okay to use contraception. The fact that that seems insanely laughable to us now just shows how far we've gone in the way we approach life. And we approach life that way because, as I said, underneath, we worship the self. In our worship for the self, many things that feel culturally normal to us, we have to admit, are actually idols. Things that are good things, but they've become ultimate things. A career is a good thing, but making a career your ultimate identity is a sinful and idolatrous and empty thing. Now we think of children who grow up not really knowing what it's like to have anything other than organized recreation. Think about it this way. Did you know that there used to be a day when children knew their father better than their ballet instructor? There was a day when they knew their grandmother better than their baseball coach. And there was a day when they knew their mother better than their personal therapist. But it's actually likely now that a six-year-old has a travel sports schedule that is six days a week. All these things show that good things that are a gift have actually now become ultimate things and therefore are a detriment. Taking care of your body is a good thing, but worshiping it is a bad thing. If you want to read about the decline of J.C. Penney, read about how they sided on athleisure. About 10 or 15 years ago, J.C. Penney was debating what kind of clothes they would have, and people said people are going to want to wear athleisure, which are like the like Under Armour type clothes. And J.C. Penney said, "No way, people are going to wear normal clothes." And then yoga pants came out, and J.C. Penney is bankrupt. <laughs> so these kind of things show how good things can actually become ultimate things, and then the whole culture shifts. So in today's culture, children tend to be endured, or they tend to be enthroned. Here's a way they're enthroned. Paul David Tripp is a Christian counselor, and he once told a story about counseling that really stuck with me. He said a woman came in to his office and brought her son with her, and she wanted Tripp to counsel her son. As he started to talk with them, she found out that this son was taking three hours of violin practice before school. Then after school, he had college prep work the whole evening, and he had scheduled things every night of the week. He, she real, Tripp realized that this child had no free time, no life, and was crumbling under the weight of his mother's pressure. So he said this to the mom. Maybe you're asking from this child something he cannot deliver. Because you need something from him, you should not. The mother was so mad, she got up, she stormed out of the office, and she said, I did not come to be counseled by you. I came for you to counsel my son so he would do what I told him to do. The reality, though, is if we're trying to find our identity and meaning and value in our children, they will be crushed under the weight. Our children cannot be escaped, but they also cannot be enthroned. So in our culture, we worship the self. The irony is, in our culture, we don't even know what the self is. The most recent addition to our Supreme Court was asked the question, what is a woman? She answered, I don't have an answer because I'm not a biologist. That'd be a little bit like asking me, Josh, how many children do you have? And I said, I don't know. I'm not an economist. It's ridiculous. But this is actually something that's been growing for the last hundred years. We don't even know what the self is. Jean-Paul Sartre is the father of existentialism, and he had a long-time companionship with a woman named Simone de Beauvoir. She wrote a very important book in 1949 called The Second Sex, and in her book she wrote this, the female is a woman only insofar as she feels herself as such. Some essential biological givens are not part of her life. Nature does not define woman. She must reclaim nature for herself. 
She continued, one is not born, but chooses to become a woman. She wrote that in 1949. You can see how that's actually come to full bloom now. Before her actually was Margaret Sanger, who wrote in 1920, perhaps you're familiar with Margaret Sanger, she founded Planned Parenthood. One of her key beliefs was the belief of eugenics. Eugenics is the idea that through uh, controlling how children are born and through genetic control, you can have a perfect race. Margaret Sanger wrote in her 1920 book, Women and the New Race, of a confident prediction of how life would go once eugenics took pervasive control in our world. She wrote, when motherhood is no longer the result of ignorance or accident, but instead eugenics, children will become the foundation of a new race. Based on her claim, child slavery, prostitution, feeble-mindedness, physical deterioration, hunger, oppression, and war will disappear from the earth. But hear how her claim goes further. When the womb becomes fruitful through desire of an aspiring love through eugenics, another Newton will come forth to unlock further the secrets of the earth and the stars. There will come a Plato who will be understood, a Socrates who will drink no hemlock, and then hear how she climaxed, and a Jesus who will not die upon the cross. So for Simone, womanhood is a biological burden that should be escaped. But for Margaret Singer, bearing children would literally be the savior for the human race. Now more of this we need to discuss on Wednesday. If you're trying to keep up with all these difficult news things, can I recommend to you the resource The Briefing by Albert Moeller. It's an excellent podcast that can help you sift through some difficult things. But I just want to point out at the outset that in our cultural moment, the self is everything, and imaging the self is most important. We think of ourselves as Plato with a will. But our brother read to us from Genesis 1 already, that God said, let us make mankind after God's image. So let us note up front that we are not Plato with a will. We are clay formed by a potter. And the potter forms us as he wills for his glory, not ours. Therefore, the very impulse to image ourselves misses what we were very created to do. God goes on to say, let us make mankind in our own image. And in the image of God, God created him, male and female, he created them. In the following verses, God called Adam and Eve to procreate, to be fruitful and multiply, and to cultivate, to have dominion over the world. Now, they need one another to do that. They can't procreate and they can't cultivate without one another. And yet, They don't have the same role in that. Their roles are not interchangeable. God has given female a capacity. He's not given male the capacity to bear a child. In fact, when we get to Genesis 3 and God talks to Adam and Eve about the the difficulty of the fall, he still addresses the capacity that God gave them. God told Adam that he'd been given a special capacity to labor, to be out in the field, but now it'll be especially difficult because of thorns. God had given Eve a special capacity to bear children, but now childbearing would be painful. But notice their capacities are distinct. They're made needing one another, but they're not interchangeable. Genesis 2.18, God describes his creation of woman. The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Here, of course, God is not saying singleness is bad. We know from the rest of Scripture how singleness is praised. He's simply saying that God made Adam to have Eve. He made man to have woman. He made marriage. He goes on to say, I will make a helper fit for him. The word helper has hit ears well for nearly 2,000 years, but in the last 50 or 60 years, that term has become one of rage and debate. How dare you use the word helper to describe woman? Now, of course, You know how a dictionary works. If you're reading a letter and you're not sure what a word means, you can't solve it at the dictionary because you'll turn to a dictionary and it'll give you two or three options. (laughs) So which option is it? Well, it depends on the context. So you go back to the letter and you read it and you read the whole thing. The Bible has 66 letters for us to read. And when you read them all together, it still means helper. Because when God said helper, he didn't mean a derogatory subservience. He meant not a burden, but a complementary team. 
God knew things that we have now forgotten, that he made man and female both valuable fully in his image, and yet distinct in their capacities. Doesn't it take effort to deny that? I've heard somebody else observe this, and I've noticed it with my own family. I have a girl, and I have three boys, and all four of them love to wrestle. Yesterday, I was wrestling with my boys, and they were all jumping on me. And when I wrestle with my boys, I'm age-appropriately rough so that they can learn to toughen up and quit whining. <laughs> but when my daughter jumps in, and she wants to wrestle too, well, I'm, I'm especially gentle because with the boys, I want them to become tough, but with her, I want her to feel loved. Because I know they're different, don't we all? God's good design is one that's sadly become slandered, but his good design is for the human flourishing of both male and female. Now, now we live in a time where we worship the self. So you might say, Josh, well, Genesis 1, 2, and 3 sound good, but what good are they for me today? The world is messed up. That's why we're in 1 Samuel 1. Look with me now in God's word in 1 Samuel 1. And we'll see how God has grace even in a world that's messed up. 1 Samuel 1, look in verse 1. There was a certain man of Ramoth Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephratite. Notice verse 2 he had two wives. See, the world's already messed up. Genesis 1 and 2, God makes Adam, he makes Eve. He has a perfect design. And here, we're only in 1 Samuel, and the world's a mess. What a great passage for us today. Now, right now, you might be visiting, you might be thinking, why do people have two wives in the Bible? You see, this is why I hate the Bible. It's got all these weird, strange, antiquated morals. The Bible allows polygamy. Well, calm down a second and keep reading. <laughs> you know? The Bible, if you read it fully, you see the Bible does not ever, ever, ever commend polygamy. In the explicit statements, it explicitly condemns it. Deuteronomy 17, 17 says, you must not take many wives. Jesus in Matthew 19 affirms Genesis 1 and 2. But even if you were just reading the story implicitly, you'll notice every time polygamy happens, problems follow. So here we are in a broken world where things are not what they should be because here's a man with two wives. The verse continues, it's even more broken. Verse 2, he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, the name of the other Peninnah, and Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. You see how the brokenness? Look how far we've come from Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1, God makes male and female for one another and tells them to be fruitful and multiply. Here we are in 1 Samuel 1, and neither thing is happening. They're both categorically not happening. Barrenness is difficult today. Infertility is hard now. But it was even more difficult in 1000 B.C. In 1000 B.C., Hannah would have been considered a spiritual sinner by most of her contemporaries. She would have been considered someone cursed with the most damning social misfortune there could be. And in her day and age, unlike our economy today, more children really did mean more money. More children meant more security. More security as you aged because there was no nursing home and there was no assisted living. So who would take care of you as you aged? Your child would. Children were desired by societies, by tribes, and by nations, and so Hannah would have been considered an outcast and felt like one. Now the text doesn't explicitly state this, but it's, it's very probable that the very reason that Elkanah added Peninnah was because Hannah bore no, no children. So this entire circumstance is one that seems horrible. As we experienced in our own life when for years we were unable to have children, we found that many people took good biblical commands like be fruitful and multiply and then took them to unbiblical conclusions like you must be sinning and that's why you can't. And surely Hannah faces the same kind of sinfulness. All I want you to notice in verse 1 and 2, though, is look how broken the world is to prepare you for how gracious God still is, even in a broken world. Verse 3, now this man, Elkanah, used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice. Now, if you're thinking, what? This guy's got two wives and he goes up to worship? He must be a total hypocrite. But from the rest of the verses, we can tell that Elkanah does appear to be a sincere believer who loves the Lord. 
If you're trying to make sense of that in your own mind, please remember this. Every generation has blind spots that several generations later, we look back and say, they used to do that? And surely we have them as well. So uh, someday people are going to look at us and think, I cannot believe you all did this. And in Elkanah's day, polygamy was sadly more common, though very sinful. So Elkanah probably didn't think much of it. In fact, the verse goes on to say, he went to the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. So he was probably a devout, though living sinfully, man, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were priests to the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and notice all her sons and daughters, she had many. Verse 5, but to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, which appears to be genuine love from a man living in a, in a difficult time. But notice how verse 5 ends. This is it's impossible to just jump over this. Though the Lord had closed her womb. How do we make sense of that? Genesis 1, be fruitful and multiply. 1 Samuel 1, verse 5, the Lord closed Hannah's womb. Why? That doesn't make any sense. First, let me point out, the text explicitly says the Lord closed her womb, but even if the text didn't say that explicitly, we would know that the Lord is sovereign over everything. Psalm 100, verse 3 says, it is not we who made ourselves, but he who made us. Proverbs sixteen thirty three says, the lot is cast into the lap, but its very decision is from the Lord. Nothing happens that's outside of God's big, wise plan. But how could this be wise? And if you were to put yourself in her shoes, how could you see this as good? We'll leave that question hanging until the end. Verse 6, and her rival, referring to Hannah's rival, Peninnah, used to provoke her grievously. These are strong words in Hebrew. They're hard to convey. But the idea is she made life exceedingly difficult. And she did this because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb. Verse 7, so it went on year by year. It's easy for us to think that something's not bad when it's all over with, but when you're in the middle of it, when Joseph has 13 years of slavery before he sees anything, that's a long time. Year after year, notice the text continues, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her there. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. So the first voice that Hannah hears in her life is the voice of Peninnah, which is essentially telling her, you're a failure. The next voice she hears is the voice of Elkanah, her husband, verse 8. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten? A number meaning full, complete, ten commandments, ten plagues, ten sons. So notice the two voices that Hannah has in her life. You have Peninnah saying, you're a failure, but if you could have children, then you'd be fulfilled. You have Elkanah saying, if you had romantic affection, surely that should be fulfilling. And what's striking is these two voices that are given to Hannah, Hannah purposely rejects them both. Verse 9, after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah Rose. It'd be easy to just read past that, but it's actually an idiom. Idioms are cultural phrases that if you uh, know the original culture, you can understand them. It'd be a little bit similar to our American idiom, she put her foot down. If you're not from America and you hear she put her foot down, you would think, what does that mean? Her foot was tired? But we know it means she took a stand. She made a resolute decision. So when she rose, she made a resolute decision. She's had enough. She's not going to listen to this voice or this voice. So what is she going to do? She's going to pray. Her resolute decision is to go to the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Now, if you're honest, it probably sounds like Hannah's bargaining with God. Like, Lord, if you give me this, I'll give you that. If you give me this, I'll give you that. But actually, that's not what's happening at all. And I want to try to show you that from the text. 
In fact, if we were to jump ahead to verse 18, there Hannah leaves with her face no longer sad. She has peace, but she's not pregnant. She's not bargaining or trying to manipulate God. Let me give some cultural background. Some other pastors have helped me here. There's 12 tribes of Israel, and one of them are the Levites. And the Levites are the only tribe that they're not allowed to own any property. They don't have any possessions because all they do is serve the Lord at the temple. Their whole life is ministry and service. But there was a way that you could have that life without being a Levite, and that was called by taking a Nazarite vow. That's a voluntary vow where you choose to divide your, your life totally to the Lord. And the most visible outward sign that you were a Nazarite was that you never cut your hair. Now, just a quick side thing that I have to laugh about. One of my son's name is Levi, and he also has very long hair. I just think his long hair is so cute, and I never want to cut it. I always want to leave it. I think it was two weeks ago, I came downstairs, and I saw Levi, sit Levi sitting at the table, and his older brother was holding a pair of craft scissors. <laughs> and I looked on the ground, and I saw all these curly clumps of hair. So if you're a Nazarite, your hair was never cut. If you're Levi you have really bad parents. That's, that's what his hair reveals right now. So the Nazarite, you know who they are because they have long hair. So wait, what is Hannah doing then? Why is she telling God, um, I will make my child a Nazarite? Lord, if you choose to give me a child, he'll be a Nazarite. In order for us to understand what she's saying, let's think about what a child would have fulfilled for her. Some of these things are still applicable today, but even more so then. If she had a child, think how that would have unlocked her social circle. Think of women getting together at the well or at the marketplace or at the village, and they're all talking about their kids, and she can't join in. Or think of how it would have opened her future security. We are so used to, in our country, thinking you can have any job you want to have. But did you know for thousands of years you did whatever your dad did? And you picked up his job and you picked up his trade. And then someday when your parents got older, you took care of them. We don't think about this at all because we can live anywhere we want in the country. And we have assisted living and we have nursing homes. But it was never that way. And this is 3,000 years ago. So Hannah, if she could have had a child, she could have talked with the other women. If she could have had a child, she could have had security. But of course, more obviously, if she could have had a child, she could have had personal Affection, someone to hold, someone to snuggle, someone to kiss, someone to be held by. Did you notice then a Nazarite child would give you none of those three? You go to the well, your kid's not with you. He doesn't learn the father's trade. He provides no security for you. You don't get to hold him and be held by him. So now do you see what Hannah is saying? She's not bargaining with God at all. Hannah is resolving. She is telling God, God, if I have you and nothing else, I have enough. Lord, if my social circle is you as my closest friend, that's enough. Lord, if my future security is you as my retirement plan, Lord, that's enough. Lord, if the person who holds me is you, that's enough. See, Hannah's song is, hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hannah is not bargaining with God. For Hannah, children should not be enthroned, nor should they be endured or escaped, but they should be entrusted. Because for Hannah, the self is not ultimate, the Lord is. See, the two voices that have been pushing on Hannah, you have Peninnah saying, children will make you happy. You have Elkanah saying, romantic affection will make you happy. And Hannah's response is, no, the Lord is enough. And so what she asks for, she's willing to relinquish because Hannah doesn't need to make an image for herself She's happy to let the Lord make her after his image. So notice verse 12. She continued praying before the Lord. Eva, Eli observed her mouth, and Hannah was speaking. In her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. Now just picture your Hannah at this point. You've already overcome the obstacle of Peninnah. You've overcome the obstacle of your insensitive husband. And now when you go to your day's pastor, he thinks you're drunk. This actually shows us how spiritually dull Eli and his household have become. We're not surprised to keep reading in chapter 1 and 2 that God rejects Hophni and Phinehas and the whole household of Eli. 
Hannah is far more in tune with the Lord and his spirit than Eli is. Verse 15, Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I'm a woman troubled in spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink. And now here's one of my favorite descriptions of prayer in the whole Bible. But I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Hannah does not fall under the pressure of Peninnah's view of fulfillment. She doesn't fall under the pressure of Elkanah's view of fulfillment. She instead brings her broken heart to the Lord. God answers that prayer. Verse 19 and 20 record the birth of Samuel, one called and heard by God. And then Hannah does what's amazing. She keeps her vow and she does bring her son Samuel back to the temple after he's been nursed. But now if you look in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, we see Hannah's prayer, her song. It's one of the longest recorded in the Bible. Hannah's song has a theme to it that's unmistakable. And it's a theme that is woven all throughout Scripture, but it's very prominent here. Her theme is that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Verses 1 through 3, she talks about that in her own life, but let's pick up in verse 4. 1 Samuel 2, verse 4, The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might or strength shall a man prevail. So verses 4 through 9, God opposes the proud but gives Grace to the humble. The Lord takes those who have exalted themselves and they are abased. And the Lord takes those who are humbled and he exalts them. But if we don't prevail by our own strength, according to verse 9, or our own might, how do we prevail? And Hannah tells us in verse 10, The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces, and against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. Scholars scratch their heads here because there was no king yet in Israel's history. So what is Hannah talking about? There is no king. All Israel has had at this point is judges. A Thamelios article put it well, declaring that Yahweh regularly exalts the lowly and confounds the powerful. This hymn foreshadows what is to come. What Hannah experiences will be replayed on a grander scale in the life of Israel and her future Messiah, the Davidic king. In English, in verse 10, you probably have the anointed one, but did you know in Hebrew it's Mashai, it's Messiah. Hannah prays the strength that I need will come from the Messiah. And did you know in Luke Chapter 1, when Mary is told that she will give birth to God's child supernaturally, do you know who she quotes in her song? Hannah. She paraphrases these words to say, The Lord, the Lord brings down the proud and the Lord lifts up the lowly. See, Hannah shows us that it is not our strength or our striving, but it is humble faith in the Lord's anointed one, his Messiah, that gives power. So the first thing we learn from today's passage is that success is humble faith in God's strength. I left a question hanging from verse 5. Do you remember it? The text says, The Lord closed Hannah's womb. What possible good purpose covenantally could God have to close Hannah's womb? And I think we now are ready for the answer. I'll just say it this way. The Lord closed Hannah's womb so he could open her eyes. Open her eyes to him, to his strength, and to his anointed one. Indeed, this theme happens throughout the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, Paul says it this way, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
Therefore, I will boast the more gladly in my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Had I not known weakness, I never could have known strength. Success is not victory through our achievement, but victory through the Lord's anointed one. See, Hannah never would have felt fulfilled through her own achievement. The voice of Peninnah, that you'll be fulfilled if you have multiple children. The voice of Elkanah, you'll be fulfilled if you have romantic affection. You'll be fulfilled if you disprove your tormentors. None of those things would have been fulfilling. Only the Lord's fulfillment. Indeed, that's how salvation works. Jesus doesn't come the first time in power and might, achieving victory through strength. If he did it that way, then salvation would only be for the powerful and the proud. But instead, Jesus came in lowly estate, born in a manger, humiliated on a cross to remind us that salvation is for the humble and trusting. Paul says the wisdom of this world thinks that the cross is foolish. The Jews demand a sign of power. The Greeks, wisdom that's laudable, but God says in verse 29, no human being should boast in the presence of the Lord. The anointed one that Hannah prayed for is actually the longing that we all have. Our souls are barren, and Christ is the ultimate son. The injustice we experience, we experience Christ alone can make right as the true just judge. Our weeping hearts have hope that's only buoyed by our Lord, and even our moral failures can only be accounted for by his suffering in our place. I like how Paul closes Galatians 6, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. See, what Hannah realized 3,000 years ago is what we've lost today. The self is not ultimate. In fact, salvation comes when we deny self. Jesus said this in Matthew 16. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a whole man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? So there's much that would need to be said, and there's much that I would want my daughter to know, but it would begin at this foundational level. The self is not ultimate, the Lord is. And when the self is not ultimate, but the Lord is, then you can trust God even when life hurts, because you trust the potters making his image. You can talk to God when your heart aches, because you know he has good purposes. And you can tune out false voices that promise false fulfillment. No, Hannah would not have been completed through romantic affection or through having children of her own fulfillment. She wouldn't have been fulfilled through career achievement or recognition, nor would we today through comfort, control, power, or approval. So what's the rest of the story? Look in 1 Samuel chapter 2 see how God finishes out his promise in her life. Verse 18, Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod. I love verse 19. And his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. So here's Hannah every year bringing a handmade garment for her son so he can serve. But notice how good God is. Look in verse 20. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So when they returned to their home, indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. But see, now it's safe for God to give them. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Look down at verse 26 and tell me if you can trace the thread. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and man. Do you not recognize that from Luke 2, 42? Here is a foreshadowing of the anointed one. And it all comes back to Hannah's dedication to realize that self is not ultimate. The Lord and his anointed one are. Let's pray together this morning. 
Dear God, we come before you, Lord, I come before you as a great sinner who loves himself naturally. I have no desire to rail against culture and act that I am not a part of it. I am completely complicit. Were the flood to come this week, I would deserve to be crushed under it. So, Lord, I thank you for what you opened Hannah's eyes to realize that the strength does not come from our achievement or our performance, that in fact you abase the proud and you only give grace to the humble, that those who think that they will secure a bright future through their own success will only find eternal failure. So, Lord, thank you that you lovingly closed her womb so that you could open her eyes. Perhaps this morning someone similarly feels stuck Remind them, Lord, that you'd never waste pain and all things are intended to point us up to the good giver, the giver who gave his own son. Lord, thank you that your anointed one is the fulfillment of this reversal of pride and humility. He came humbled and in lowly estate and on the cross he was stripped to be humiliated, but he did so willingly so that all the consequences that stood against us, he would fulfill them and say it is finished and rise victoriously. And Lord, thank you now that he opens his arms to give grace to any who bow the knee in faith. And I pray this morning that some, like Hannah, would pour out their soul to God and reject the voices of our culture that offer them false fulfillment. Remind us, Lord, that the self has never been a hole that can be filled. It is an empty pit that is never satisfied. And Lord, such has been the case since the garden. But now in our culture right now, we have pushed so strongly against your good design. We have arrogated to ourselves the position of creator and acted that we could make something better. But Lord, when Plato thinks it has a will, it can never make something that stands. And so thank you, Lord, that you are the good potter and that you make clay for good purposes. So Lord, we pray that the image that we would be most full of this morning is the image of our great God expressed fully through the person of your Son. Thank you for he who is full of grace and truth for every heart this morning. In his name I pray, amen.
We thank you for your word that is such a rich fountain of truth and wisdom. Lord, we thank you for your grace and sending your son into a broken world to save broken people. Lord, we praise you. We want to honor you this day. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You all are dismissed.